Good evening. I, I, I heard one. Good evening, First Baptist Church. There we go. Welcome, 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 welcome. Well, as we've been trying to remind, we were reminding on Sunday, and I'll remind you again tonight, um, if you come here at this time next week, you'll be, we'll be leaving. Is that, is that how it works? You gotta, you gotta, your clocks have to fall back this weekend. And as our, uh, as our former uh, associate pastor Bill Lyle says, according to the U.S. government, that happens at 2 o'clock in the morning. So you have to set your alarm, wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning, fall back, and then go back to sleep. You, you can't just fall back right when you get in bed. That doesn't work. Somehow you'll get off. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Just, just, <laughs> just make sure one way or another you uh, set your clocks back this weekend uh, so you'll be on time. And uh, it'll be even darker right now than it, than it is right now. But you know what? It's bright in here, and we're going to make it even brighter by singing all together. Love found a way. Let's stand and start our service together. Wonderful love that rescued me, sunk deep in sin. Guilty and vile as I could be, no hope within. When every ray of light had fled, oh, glorious day. Raising my soul from out the dead, love found a way. Love found a way to redeem my soul. could make me whole. Love sent my Lord to the cross of shame. Love found a way. Oh, praise his holy name. Love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. For such a sinful wretch as I, how can it be? Love bridged the gulf twixt me and him, taught me to pray. I am redeemed, set free, forgive. Love found a way, love found a way to redeem my soul. Love found a way that could make me whole. Love sent my Lord to the cross of shame. his holy name. Love opened wide the gates of light to heaven's domain, where in eternal power and might Jesus shall reign. Love lifted me from depths of woe to endless day. There was no help in earth below. Love found a way. sent my Lord to the cross of shame. Love found a way, oh, praise his holy name. No, you're not saying wrong. Usually pastor comes up, opens in prayer, reads a few folks to pray for, and then I come with the missionary letter. So, we're switching tonight. We're, I'm doing his part and he's doing mine. Uh, go ahead and you may be seated. We're going to have a word of prayer in just a moment. Just want to remember some folks that we do need to pray for. Um, we'll just start right at the top. I want to be praying for uh, Barbara Granger's daughter-in-law, uh, Debbie Granger. Uh, she's really uh, in bad shape and uh, lost a lot of weight and uh, I believe it's cancer-related, but she's very critical, and we need to remember her in prayer. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Rusty Allegood is uh, having a committal service down at Sarasota National Cemetery, and I think Brother Jim is going to be there for that. Celeste Busby's got another treatment coming up on the 12th of uh, this month. 
Uh, David Hurt is wait, awaiting brain surgery that will be the 1st of December and then two following procedures after that. Betty and Jim Ballard, uh, Kathy Dean, uh, pray for Kathy who has uh, cancer and Ron Welsh who is diagnosed with kidney stones. Uh, we got a note, uh, Pastor received a note uh, from Gladys Yonkers' uh, son and uh, she had uh, like a mild stroke and uh, they did surgery uh, with a, a bypass, 90% blockage, and uh, the surgery was a success, but the recovery is being very difficult, and he asked us to pray for his mom. And then Alan Smith, who was in Sandy Weatherholt's class, had a mild stroke, but he's doing well. And then Sarah Ackley had uh, uh, surgery, eye surgery, uh, cataract surgery. She's going to the doctor tomorrow. And uh, many others that we need to pray for, but those are the ones that are the most critical. So let's have a word of prayer. And then after that, Pastor will come with the missionary emphasis tonight and just pray for a great service. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. God, we just ask now that uh, you'd be with our service tonight. We thank you uh, for our music and thank Brother Robert and the good song that we just sang. Uh, love found a way, and we are so thankful for that. So, Lord, we just commit this night to you. We pray that your will will be accomplished, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before Pastor does come, we still have the sign-up sheet for Sunday uh, for the uh, pig roast, for the uh, salads and so forth. And also, if anybody would like uh, an obituary of Ruby Bastris. Uh, I have them there in the back. Just go by and pick them up. There's one already posted of Ruby. And just pick up one of the observers and it'll be in there. Well, we've got an email that came to us today from Frank and Karen Otterson. There are missionaries to Ethiopia. They're not in Ethiopia. They're in their 80s and probably won't be going back. Uh, go ahead and show us their picture. We're going to kind of play this thing through. Because this is, uh, they wrote, uh, here's the latest information we received from the American Embassy in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is in a civil war. It began a year ago tomorrow. And there's a security update. The situation there deteriorating really fast in the last several days. Uh, they strongly suggest that U.S. citizens seriously reconsider any travel to Ethiopia and are asking folks who are Americans to leave the country. Uh, anyone who's at, at the U.S. Embassy in Addis is told to not leave the, the city except to leave the country. The travel advisory is due to communication disruptions, crime, potential for terrorism, and kidnapping in border areas. Uh, when Ethiopia has problems, the first thing they do is shut down the internet, shut down cellular data, and phone services, and so it makes it very difficult to... Uh, know what's going on. Give us the next slide. We've got several folks in Ethiopia right now. This is the Dykes family, and they work at the Joyce's, in Joyce's Kids Ministry, but they're working at the Victory School for the Deaf. Uh, Victory School for the Deaf is headmaster, headmistress really, is Gomaja, and that is Mimi's mother, and she's got some health issues. Uh, she is not in as much danger as others because she's Ethiopian in the main city. But the dykes have to make some decisions pretty quick on whether they're going to stay in Ethiopia or leave. And with him being American, her being an Ethiopian, there are times that Ethiopia has simply said, no, Ethiopians aren't leaving, and Americans have to. And they would put that family in a very difficult situation. Should be another slide right after them. Other uh, Burhanu and Wubut are Ethiopians who are there in the country. What's happened is that, um, let's, go ahead, let's hit the next one, we'll get a map, and then we'll come back. Here's Ethiopia on a map. It's Africa. Africa is huge. You notice in the bottom right-hand corner, the 1,000 miles. Uh, America, the United States, is about 2,500 miles across. Africa's twice that. So it is a very large country. Next slide, I gave you some idea about Ethiopia. Over in the very top, Tigray, and that's where the problem has started. Right up here. Uh, Amhara and Afar are also involved in the problem. And we're going to be talking about a city that's right in here. Right there. So members of the Ethiopian military from Tigra uh, 
rebelled and betrayed their military comrades, slaughtered several thousand Ethiopian soldiers about a year ago. And now the Tigrays are moving south. They are moving through the provinces of Amhara and Afar. They're looting and robbing, abusing, and killing. According to the United Nations, both sides have been guilty of war crimes. The government has been accused of deliberately starvation as a war tactic. But Ethiopian's prime minister, who is a believer in Christ, named Abai Ahmed, claims that a UN report vindicates the government having, that they have not committed genocide. And you ask, what does this have to do with our country or with our church? Well, we support four missionaries in Ethiopia, and three of them are there now, and two of them are in danger. Uh, Frank and Karen Otterson, uh, in their mid and upper 80s, probably never going to go back. Gomaj is an Ethiopian, and she lives in a compound, and very safe for her. She is deaf. Travis and Mimi, and their two children, twins, and then Burhamu and Wubit. Uh, Burhanu is an evangelist, and he has been in Addis Ababa, and he has been up in these two areas starting churches. He's from Addis, and going through those areas... He's been working with refugees, and he's also been working with Islamists. Uh, there's a lot of folks in Islam that are just, they are Islamic in name only. They're not actually uh, a part of it. Burhanu started a church in Kumblacha in Amhara years ago, and that's in this area right there. Uh, those folks are in great danger. The Tigray have made their way to that city, and the believers in that town are in danger. And Wubut's family lives in that town, and they've not been heard from in months. They have no idea if they're alive. Uh, they just have n no contact at all from them. I spoke with John Yingling today about them and got uh, a little more information, and he said that they are really concerned about Wubut's family, and they are now to the place where they are thinking the worst, that they may never see them again. Um, so we need to pray for two of those families. Can we run them back and look at the uh, dykes and also Burhanu and Wubut? There are the dykes, and there's Burhanu and Wubut. Burhanu is about 60 years old. His uh, father was a Muslim and one of the first men that Brother Richard Vick led to Christ when he was in Ethiopia. And Burhanu was, had the benefit of being raised in the faith and became the pastor of 30 years pastor of the church there in uh, Addis. And now he is the president of the Victory School for the Deaf and an evangelist. And then, so both these folks, Rahan is about uh, probably 60 years old, and he has got a real problem with sugar diabetes. Uh, about two years ago, he was in that area uh, near that city I showed you earlier. And uh, no restrooms there, so he needed to relieve himself. He went away from the group and never came back. And they found him. He had been beaten and robbed and thrown into a ditch. And literally, his life was just hanging by a thread, and he did survive. Uh, I'm going to pause right now. We're going to pray for the dykes for wisdom. They need to have wisdom as far as whether they stay or go. And then they need the grace of God to get out of that country for the sake of their lives. And then Burhan and Wubut, they're not going to be leaving the country. Ethiopia doesn't let their folks leave very easily. So we need to pray for their safety while they stay in their homeland. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to bring this request before you. We're thankful that Frank and Karen are not in the country think that their lives are not at risk. We do pray for Gomaja. Although her situation is better than the others, it's still precarious. We ask that you give Travis and Mimi wisdom. We pray you supply their financial needs if they need them to make their way out of the country. Lord, we know that they also have worked and have areas that they can go to in Zambia, so we pray that you would give them wisdom as for what they should do how long they should stay. We pray also for Burhanu and especially for Wubut. We ask you, Lord, to comfort her. Uh, can only imagine what's going through her mind, having not heard from her family and now having the communication lines totally cut off. 
We pray for her family. We pray that if they are alive, you continue to spare them. And if they are victims of this war, we pray for comfort for her. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I have one other prayer request that was handed to me Sunday night uh, from uh, the Hagers. Uh, Martin asked us to please pray for Dreama. She recently had a biopsy on her lungs, and they found that she has rapidly growing microbacteria. She has been to an infectious disease doctor and trying to determine medical treatment, and she's now in a situation where the infectious disease doctor is saying one thing, and her lung specialist is saying something else. And they're not agreeing, and they don't know what they're going to do, uh, but they ask us to please pray that uh, they can get this thing resolved and decide what the treatment is. Brother Robert, would you please come? Jerry had already mentioned the, um, the dinner on the grounds coming this Sunday. And uh, if you stick around after the dinner on the grounds, we will be having a music concert uh, back here in the auditorium. Uh, all the, the dinner on the grounds and the concert will be instead of our normal evening worship service. But if you stick around for the concert after our dinner and fellowship and come back over here, this song, you will hear it in a way that you've probably never heard it before. And I know I haven't, so it'll be a first for me too. That's all I'm going to say. I don't want to give away everything. Uh, but uh, it'll be on the concert uh, in a unique way. But we're going to go ahead and sing it. Uh, so let's stand one more time. He touched me as we sing just one more time tonight. Shackled by a head. touched me and now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and oh what joy that floods my soul something happened and now touched me and made me whole. Since I met his blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me. Take a moment and greet each other tonight. Have a moment of fellowship. We'll be right back with a special in just a moment.
All right. Well, as you uh, make your way back to your seats, um, I can tell you that uh, this, this song God put in my field of awareness the other day. Uh, and sometimes you, you just find a song and all, all of a sudden you realize, why is it that I haven't sung that song in a while? You guys can go ahead and have a seat. What? Yeah, go ahead and have a seat. Please do. Please do. Um, so, uh, anyway, just, just uh, I, was like, I had almost forgotten all about this song. So, um, it's called Here I Stand. Hope you enjoy it. Savior who bled my sacrifice, you are the one that I seek. Here I stand to worship, here I stand to call on your name, here I stand. Offer my heart to the one who carried my sin. I surrender all that I am. Here I stand. You came to earth, sent as a lamb to die. We're studying about the life of Peter, Matthew chapter 14. Sunday morning, a fellow came up to me after. He said, uh, do you just go Romans only? I said, well, we've been in Romans since the first Sunday of this year, and we'll probably be in Romans until the last Sunday of this year. He said, well, is it the only thing you study? I said, if you come on Wednesday night, you hear me beat up Peter, because we're doing Peter a lot. Some of the night said, we still doing Peter? Yeah. We're going to do Peter for a while, too, because there's a lot about this guy. I don't know how long it's going to take us, but it'll be months. On Sundays, we're going to go Colossians after we finish Romans. So that'll be the first part of the year. Last Wednesday evening, we began to study the story of Jesus' long walk and Peter's brief walk on water. We examined the sending to the sea, verse 22 of Matthew 14. Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get in a ship, to go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And the evening was come, he was there alone. So 
disciples didn't have to do their dirty job of sinning away. Jesus took care of it. Here we go. Next one. The storm on the sea. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. In the same story, Matthew chapter 6 has, tells us that they were towing and rowing. And Matthew 14, verse 25, mentions the fourth not white watch of the night between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. So they have been rowing out there for six to nine hours, and they've traveled about three or four miles in that time. It is not a happy occasion for them. And so in verse 25 through 27, the Savior arrives on the sea. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit. They cried out for fear. Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. You know the Bible's most frequent command? Right there. Be not afraid. Matter of fact, if you go to the internet and type up Bible's most frequent command, it comes up number one. Don't be afraid. I have a friend that I was with this week. His business is struggling. He's a believer, but he's just petrified of the COVID thing. Everyone in the office is wearing masks. If you pull the mask down at all, someone there tells you about it. And he said to me, how's your church going? I said, it's going really well. He said, really? He said, we're struggling here. And I said, that's you know, unusual. I, I talked to some of his employees, and they love their boss. And he said to me, I just can't keep employees. And I said, that's odd because the people that work for you love you. And I thought about it and prayed about it. In the middle of the night, it hit me. He's promoting fear. And you can only live in it so long until you want to escape. I don't like scary movies. I don't understand why anybody would go to Bush Gardens to be scared. I'm not paying you money to scare me. <laughs> My fear is that you'd scare me and I'd punch somebody and then I'd get arrested for it. I, I don't understand any of it. I don't like scary movies. The last week of October, there was nothing on television that I wanted to watch because everything was spook movies, and I don't like them. And my wife hates them. I mean, she, if I wanted to leave the room, all I got to do is put on a scary movie. She gets out so quick. You can live in fear, but after a short while, you will want to escape. And I am now in the process of praying about going to see this friend again in a couple of weeks, and I, I may say to him, I, can, can we talk about some spiritual things and say, I believe the problem is fear. No one likes it. You can only live in it so long, and if, if you're promoting fear, uh, by the way, I felt the fear. I was at his business for about an hour. And I looked at the faces of the people that worked there, and they were dejected and down. And Eddie's a wonderful, wonderful man. Believer. Uh, here's the thing. Believers do not have the spirit of fear. It doesn't come from the Lord. Spirit of fear comes from Satan. And if you as a believer are spreading fear, not just in for yourself, but you're spreading fear, you, you've kind of changed sides. And you're on the wrong side of the equation. See, I don't want to die. But if I live my entire life in fear of death, I'm actually fearing the one thing that's going to be the best thing that ever happens in my life. I re years ago, I read Matthew Henry. Someone robbed him after a service. And his statement was, threatened his life, by the way. He said, you can't scare me with heaven. <laughs> if you really believe it takes fear out. Uh, just let you know, probably a dozen times in my life, I've been in a hospital with a church member who's dying of a communicable disease. And I have held hands with them as they passed away. I have prayed with them. There have been some who've lost their hearing, and I literally had to get my face down near their ear 
and they had a communicable disease, and they breathed on me. There have been times I thought to myself as I left the hospital, I may have just cursed myself. I don't want to die, but I'm not going to live afraid. It's a horrible way to live. Now, every time the, in the Word of God, the command, be not afraid, is given, it's given for a good reason. I'll give you a couple reasons. Number one reason, someone's afraid. Number two reason, there's a reason they're afraid. People aren't afraid just for nothing. There are a reason that people fear, and God's, God's message to them is the same. Don't be afraid. Well, here it's, don't be afraid. It is I. In verse 28 and 29, we find the supplication on the sea. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. In verse 29, and he said, come. The prayer was longer than the answer. I wonder about that. You know, sometimes we pray long, long, long prayers, and the Lord says, yeah, sure. This evening, we'll study the second half of the story, picking it up in the second half of verse 29 and reading down through verse 33. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O ye of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? Jesus just labeled fear. He just labeled fear as a lack of faith. Jerry had a bunch of stickers that went around there for a while, and I've seen a bunch of them on cars, faith over fear. Uh, it's a good saying because it's accurate. Jesus had told him earlier, don't be afraid, it's I. Lord, if it's you, can I come to you? Sure. He goes out, and then he looks the wrong thing, and he sinks again, and he's in fear again. And Jesus says, the reason you are afraid is your faith is small. Verse 32. And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Jesus was doing the impossible, walking on the water. Peter's about to join the Lord with the Lord's permission. So in verse 29, he steps out on the sea. He did the impossible. He walked on water. Seems logical to focus on what Peter was doing, which is fine, but we should also focus on who he was obeying. He asked for permission. The Lord gave permission, and once the Lord gave permission, he was obeying the Lord by getting out of the boat and walking. Before Peter attempted to do what Jesus was doing, which was impossible, he asked permission to do the impossible. Uh, Peter's on a roller coaster here. From being afraid that it's a spirit to not being afraid of that which is dangerous, walking in the water and asking permission, to being afraid because he got his eyes on the wrong thing and started to sink. I think it's incredible faith to ask God to allow you to do that which is impossible. I mean, he's way up here and way down here and way up here and way down there. This is... I love roller coasters. Roller coasters scare my wife to death. I like them because they go from zero to 60 right now. That's great. I don't care so much for the ones that go, woo, 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 woo. I just, I just want to go fast and straight. I don't mind doing this. I don't mind going up and down. Don't flip me upside down. Don't make me sick. I just like roller coasters. I don't like the whoop de doos Peter's on a roller coaster of emotions. But he asked for it. Ever ask God to use you? Dear God, use me to serve you. Do you understand you're asking for a roller coaster? That's what ministry is. It's a lot of emotions, highs and lows. 
I'm not going to criticize Peter in any way for what happened because the man had way more faith than I did have, ever have. It never crossed my mind. Hey, can I walk on water? Some years ago, we were asked as a church to pray for a, a woman. She had cancer, and she had read James chapter 5, and she came in, and she said, I, I want the church to, to lay hands on me and pray over me and anoint me with oil so I'll be healed. And we met with deacons and missionaries. We had two or three missionaries at that time in the church and some preachers who were retired and decided what we could do, what we should do. That particular person we did not do this with. We had done it once before, a couple of years earlier, to a young woman who was actively serving the Lord. This one had not served the Lord in her life at all. She was just looking for a miracle, an escape, and she thought she had found a magic bullet, I guess. And one of our missionaries said, I can't be involved in this. I don't have the faith for it. Which made our deacons go, what? The man was being honest. He and I later talked and he explained to me, he said, the woman doesn't serve the Lord. Why, why would the Lord heal her? She's never served him as far as I can tell in her life. And he said, I appreciate Bill, who is the father of her, wanting his daughter to live. He said, but I, don't, I just don't think this is the right thing at all. He said, I'd be asking God for a miracle when I don't believe God will provide the miracle. He said, I think it's best for me to stay away. I think he was right. So it almost makes you sound charismatic. You ever ask God for a miracle? I have. For sake of my children, I have. For health of some of my church members, I have. When Peter stepped out of that boat and walked on the water, he did the impossible. He also did the improbable. Now, if the sea is smooth, if the wind is not blowing, and Jesus is walking on a sea of glass, I might come up with the idea, hey, think I could come out there? But if the wind is boisterous and the waves are rocking the boat, it doesn't call in my mind to get out of the boat. The boat is safety. I'm not leaving the boat. And Peter says, can I hop out? I would love to see, I don't know how you do it, I would love to see the picture of the movie when Peter got out of the boat. If the boat is rocking and rolling back and forth, how did he get out? Did he stand on the bow and take a jump, land on the water, or did he one leg over, the other leg over, hanging on the side? I have no idea how it took place, and the Lord didn't bother to tell us anything. But the weather conditions on that night said this was a fatal mistake. But when God offers you a command, even after you ask for permission, he'll provide the means to accomplish his will. It was Jesus' will for him to come. The Lord knew he was going to ask the question. He's omniscient. He asked the question. He said, come on out. And now Peter has everything he needs to do what God is allowing him to do. The issue is not really you. Your part is to trust and obey the Lord. The issue is God and his will. And so in verse 29, the second half, the obedience of Peter was immediate. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on water to go to Jesus. That which is required to obey Jesus, no matter what he tells us to do, is to believe in him. Because if you don't believe in him, you're not going to try. If we believe in him, we'll trust his word for us and we'll do what he says. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16 tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the reason for that is, without faith, you won't obey God. And if you don't obey, you're not going to please him. If you don't have faith, you're going to try, try anything other than what you can do on your own, in your own power, in your own strength. Much of the Lord's will for us, both his perfect will and his permissive will, is related to time. The request that Jesus granted for Peter to come walk on water had a time element to it. 
it will be obeyed then at that time in that moment or the opportunity was going to be lost and never returned. Peter didn't say, can I walk on water anytime I want? The idea is, can I come to you? Can I walk on water right now? And for that moment in time, the Lord said, come. What took place pre next precluded Peter ever being tempted to tell the story of his walking on water? Had Peter walked on water out to Jesus and they turned around and walked their way back into the ship and got in the ship and then everything was just fine and then the wind stopped, it would have been a bragging session, tempting. Did I ever tell you about the time I walked on water? I've done what no one else has ever done. I mean, no one else even thinks of stuff like this, but I, Peter the Apostle, walked on water. The fact that he got in that boat soaked well, so it just stopped any temptation to ever brag. Did I ever tell you about the time I walked on water? Yeah, you got soaked, didn't you? You about drowned, didn't you? You cried out to Jesus to help you, didn't you? Didn't work out so good, did it, big boy? Uh, Peter's not going to talk about this to anybody at any time. Someone else might talk about it. He's not. Look at verse 30 and 31. We'll call it the sinking into the sea. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Peter and the other disciples are on the Sea of Galilee in a boat in a storm because Jesus put him on the boat and told him what to do and where to go. They are in this predicament because the Lord willed them to be in this predicament. They have done exactly what he told them to do, and now they've got problems. They could be saying, I don't understand you, God. I did exactly what you wanted me to do. And now look at this. My life is in danger because of you. This was the outcome of them being in the perfect will of God. The wind is boisterous. The waves are strong. The boat is rocking. And they are in God's perfect will for their lives. They didn't ask Jesus, should we get in the boat? The Lord said, get in the boat, go to the other side. These fellas, they simply obeyed the Lord, and now they've got lots of trouble. Then they saw the Lord coming. And as soon as they realized it was Jesus, they knew everything was going to be fine. So Peter as a result of his extreme trust in Jesus, asked permission to join the Lord in a miracle walk. The Lord granted the request. Peter climbed out of the boat, onto the water, and everything is fine for a brief moment of time. Things very quickly changed. Everything was not fine. Can you imagine it? Problem arrived soon after a miracle was experienced. We've got a whole segment of Christianity Day that talks about miracles as if they're, it's the, the be all end all. It's the most wonderful thing ever. You get a miracle. Something good is going to happen to you. Yeah, something bad might happen right after the something good too. And it's still God's will for you. This does not fit the modern theology of God. I shouldn't say the modern theology of Christianity that God wants your life to be perfect. I mean, if you just love the Lord, if you just live for the Lord, if you give him plenty of money and tithing, you will have no problems. I mean, fellas, your, your wife's not going to get old and wrinkled. Your children will all be obedient. They, they will always just say, yes, sir, no, sir. Whatever you tell them to do, they're going to go, oh, I, I just I am so thankful that you are my father. This is a wonderful life that we have, Dad. I just, I just want to thank you for providing all the wonderful things you provide for me. You've fed me every day of my life. You've given me clothes. You are the most wonderful father ever. And Mom, she's the greatest. Did I tell you what I did to my daughter-in-law? This is a side note. Last time my Josh, Katie, and his three kids were with us, the girls and I were up in the bedroom. We're having a talk, and one of the girls says to me, we've got friends that they don't have good parents at all. 
their parents are just, they're mean to them. They yell at them. They're, they're not home. They, they, and, they just, and I said, you know what, girls? God has really been good to you. He's given you a father who loves you, who will sacrifice for you. I mean, God has just done wonderful things for you. And your mother, she's okay too. And the youngest one went, oh, I'm telling mom. <laughs> And she shot out of that room. She went down, and I walked downstairs, and Katie's sitting there looking at me going, okay, huh? Uh-huh. Okay? I said, you are okay. I mean, just. So for Christmas, she gave me a coffee cup that says, world's okayest father-in-law. <laughs> I think it's great. Every time I see it, it makes me laugh. That's my little story. Now we'll go back to this. <laughs> the problem, by the way, is not Jesus. Their life is not perfect. They followed Jesus. They gave up their careers. They've served Jesus. They're now in a boat because Jesus told them to get to in a boat. They go into the place Jesus told them to go. Peter has faith that the rest of them don't have. Peter's out walking on water, and then he sees something. Something that's been there the whole time. He saw the wind boisterous. It had been boisterous for six hours at least. And then he thought something that he ought not think. I'm going to sink. And he did. He saw the wind, and the result of the wind, the wave, he became afraid. In the Christian life, fear is all you need to keep you from doing what you ought to do. When's the last time you told someone about Jesus? Doesn't matter when. I'll tell you why you didn't. Fear. Fear will keep you from obeying the Lord. Fear will keep you from doing that which you know you ought to do. Once you're afraid, everything in your life will change. And the fear will become the master in your life. Now, I'm not suggesting foolishness. I'm suggesting you keep your eyes on the Lord, which is what Peter failed to do. He took his eyes off of the Lord. He began looking at the boisterous wind, and that's when he sank. You keep your eyes on the Lord in the midst of a storm. You keep your eyes on the Lord in the midst of trial. You keep your eyes on the Lord in the midst of that which would drive you into fear without the Lord. It is I, be not afraid. Has the Lord promised to be with you and to never leave you and never forsake you? Well, if you have the Lord with you, why would you be afraid? I'm 11 years younger than my brother. I'm number two in the family. He's number one. Growing up, if I was with my brother, I have no memories of ever being afraid. Part of the reason why, I could tell my friends, my brother will beat you up. <laughs> well, yeah, he's 11 years older, so what a big deal that is. My brother solved my fears. By his presence. Now, my brother was sickly, but I didn't know that. My brother had allergies, horrible allergies. And I remember going to the doctor with him on many occasions. He didn't wait in the waiting room. He had a standing thing. He would go right to the back room, right into a room, roll up his shoulder, and I would watch as the nurse put a needle right there and give him his allergy shot. And I've seen him do it dozens of times. And as a five-year-old boy, I remember thinking, my brother is tough. Anybody could have can take that. And he didn't wince. He didn't blink. As a five-year-old, I was really impressed. And so my brother's presence kept fear away from me. And you become aware of the presence of the Lord. He tends to just push fear out. Peter knew the right thing to do. Lord, save me. Eyes off the Lord, 
eyes onto the Lord. The key to living a life of peace in the midst of the storm is keeping your eyes on the Lord. You have, you have circumstance in your life. The circumstances are the wind and the wave. If you look at the circumstances instead of Christ, circumstances become overwhelming. When your focus leaves Christ, when you concentrate on circumstances that surround you, you become a victim of the circumstance. That is precisely what happened to Peter. He began to sink. How much? Well, he began to sink. We're not told how much he sank. We're told he was beginning to sink. That might mean feet. It might mean ankles. It might mean calves. It might mean knees. I don't know how deep you go when you're beginning to sink, but it was enough to scare him. By the way, we know Peter could swim because there are other times that Peter jumped out of the boat and swam to Jesus. So it's not that he's afraid he's going to drown because he can't swim. He's a strong swimmer. In this brief moment, after experiencing something no one else in the world has ever experienced, his success, success turned into failure because he took his eyes off of Jesus, and when he did, he began to fear. Fear instead of faith is a recipe for failure. It has a crippling effect on us. It affects the life of the believer. It affects the life of those who serve God. Fear creates silence when a testimony is called for. Fear causes us to say when the Lord tells us to go. Fear replaces faith, and soon we lose the opportunity to lead a victorious life because we are afraid. And it is so <laughs> common, this malady of fear, that it is the most common command in the Bible. Be not afraid. So verse 30 and 31, here's the saving from the sea. For Peter, failure did not, or failure from fear did not lead to disaster because the Lord was near. When he cried, the Lord answered the prayer, and the Lord answered the prayer immediately, just like Peter obeyed the Lord immediately. So here's a modelful prayer. Verse 30, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Same circumstances that he ignored caused him to recognize he had a need. Was it wet feet? Ankles, knees, who knows? The same circumstances he ignored to ask permission to come to Jesus were the same circumstances that brought fear upon him when he took his eyes off Jesus. So, as soon as he recognizes his need, he prays. Here's the prayer he did not pray. Our Father God in heaven, I just want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've ever done for me. You've been so good to me, and go on and on. Nor did he pray, Father, 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 Lord, 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 Lord. I'm convinced that when you pray in public, you don't need to go into great detail. Who are you trying to impress? If you've been asked to pray for the food, pray for the food. If you're asked to pray for the church service, pray for the church service. If you're in a prayer meeting, pray for everything. Pray for everybody. That's the purpose of it. But when you actually have a need, pray for the need. Like, Lord, save me. It was an effectual, fervent prayer from a man who was serving the Lord, living by faith, attempting great things for God, and then some, suddenly overwhelmed by the fear of the circumstances, the prayer, the prayer was very appropriate. Three words. Was it effective? Yes. I think this prayer is effective. Dear Lord, bless our food. Thank you very much. Amen. I don't have a problem with bless the hands that fed, that prepared it. Bless those who purchased it. I, I think if you want to pray and say, dear Lord, bless this food and bless the fellowship, that's fine. But if you're praying and the food's getting cold, you're helping others not be thankful for the food. Stop that. <laughs> I remember going to Thanksgiving and saying to my dad, they're coming to our house, so my dad's in charge of who's praise, and I'd say, Dad, don't have Uncle Harold pray, please. <laughs> he said, why? Because by the time he's done praying, the food's cold. He was the preacher in the family. He could pray. It's marvelous prayer. 
my opinion, not appropriate. Pray for the food. So here's the prayer. It was prudent. The right kind of prayer is the right time. It's always the right time to pray. A crisis time is certainly a good time and it's a acceptable time for pray. The time to pray is now. I've got to where if I see an accident, automobile, doesn't matter, in my car, I, I just stop and pray. Help those people. This might be the worst day in their life. I pray for all of them. I see folks on the side of the road. They're often in shock. Sometimes they're crying. Sometimes an ambulance is there. They need prayer. I don't stop. I don't make a big deal of it. I just pray for them. The prayer is prompt. When it comes to praying about a problem, it makes sense that the sooner one starts praying, the better. The best time to pray is soon. Well, this is something we're going to have to pray about. No, start praying now. How about this one? The prayer was passion-filled. Lord, save me. It expressed the feeling of his heart. It was effectual. It reflected the experience of his life. Pray soon and pray with great effect. James 5, 16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Last one. He's in the place of prayer. You know where the place of prayer is? The place of a problem. If you got a problem, you're in the place of prayer. He's sinking in the midst of a storm on, with the wind boisterous and the waves going. He didn't kneel to pray. He couldn't. I think we're superstitious on prayer. I think sometimes we think if we get in the right posture, God answers us more. Pharisees stood and prayed. I had a friend in Bible college who was from Israel, actually from Bethlehem. He was an Arab, not a Jew. And he said to us, I don't understand you people. He said, what do you mean? Jesus said, watch and pray. But you always have your heads closed and your heads down and your, and your eyes open, your eyes closed. He said, if your head's down and your eyes are closed, how are you watching while you pray? I remember thinking, I don't think you're taking that verse the right way. I know why we bow our head and close our eyes. Bow your head for reverence. You close your eyes to keep the kids from doing everything else. At our house, we have our children bow their heads and close their eyes at the dinner table to pray because it keeps them from eating, even during a brief prayer. There have been times I've prayed so briefly that we've caught the children with the food in their hand on the way to their mouth, and they're going, oh, oh got you. They knew better. So we, we got to where in our family, when the kids were little, we held hands to pray. That stopped a lot of it. Close your eyes. One time I said to my, one of my kids, why were your eyes open when you prayed? And they said, why were your eyes open? Because <laughs> it's my job to sneak around and make sure you're doing right. I'm the father. Yeah. How about this one? There's a picture of the gospel in verse 31. Immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. With this prayer, Peter acknowledged he couldn't save himself. And Jesus did. This, this prayer was a result of Peter trusting Jesus to do for him what he could not do for himself. It's like a prayer of salvation. Lord, save me. He caught him as he sank. Peter survived the experience, and eventually, in verse 32 and 33, Jesus got him back to the boat where he was safe from the storm and the sea. But before Peter got back in the boat, Jesus solved the problem for Peter. But until Jesus got in the boat, he didn't solve the problem for the rest of them. Verse 31. O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? You realize that was said while they were in the water? Jesus says, just pick Peter up. And the first thing he said is, man, your faith is weak. Now let's go back to the boat. Jesus saved Peter, scolded him a little bit. His compassion for Peter preceded his correction of Peter. Jesus did not say Peter had no faith. He says he has little faith. But Peter had just attempted to do by faith something that I would never have done or even thought of. 
Lord, let me come to you. Let me walk on water just like you. Peter had little faith, and Peter's little faith exceeds my faith. So when Jesus said, O thou of little faith, it's not just Peter that gets that one. That hit me too. Because I think Peter had more faith than me. So Peter's rebuked, not for trying something no one else thought of. Not for doing what only the Lord was doing. Not for sinking. The only thing Peter is corrected for is having little faith, which is the reason he sank. He had more faith than others. The Lord recognized the man's problem, addressed it, and I think he also addressed it with just the two of them. He could have waited until he got in the boat and said this. He says that when the wind is boisterous, I think probably Peter's the only one that heard it. There are some times the Lord speaks to you and you only. That's a good thing. I remember one time years ago in an audience of people and there was an altar call given and people all around me went forward and I had no, I just had, I had no feeling. I didn't want to go forward at all. And later that night, laying in bed, thinking about it, I kind of got jealous. And I was praying. I said, Lord, why did you speak to others and not to me? Now, it may have been that they were more sensitive than I. I it may have been that the preacher, you know, used emotion to, to jerk him out of the, I, I've seen it done. You have too. If you love God, you need to be down here. Well, I love God, but you're not going to do that to me. You're not going to manipulate me. I don't remember it being that way. I just remember that I, I was aware that God had spoken to people all around me and not me. Jesus said that what Peter did required a little bit of faith. Walking on water doesn't require much faith. And that convicts me because for me, Walking on water would require more faith than what I have. So Jesus has just measured my faith and says, you got a little bit. I think the incident teach, should teach us that God's standard for human faith is way higher than what we recognize as a reasonable standard for human faith. Maybe it's reasonable for us to take an inventory of our faith and evaluate what it ought to be. Uh, so I said, what are you doing that requires faith? In this COVID culture, it might be that attending church is requiring great faith of you. Can I commend you? Now, the honest truth is, it doesn't require a lot of faith for me to come to church because I'm not afraid of COVID. I'm not afraid. I had the disease. I had the antibodies. Every study that I've read, especially those from Israel that just came out last week, says that my immunity is 25 times stronger than those who are taking the vaccine. I have immunity to every new variant that comes out. I'm not afraid of COVID at all. So it takes no faith for me to come to church. But if you've not had the disease and you're afraid and you're here, you're still coming, I want to thank you. Because that means you are using faith to overcome fear. That's a good thing. Verse 32 and 33 is the serenity from the sea. When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. After the scolding, the Lord calmed the sea by getting into the boat. The end result of this miracle was worshipped by the Savior, by those in the boat, in the water, those who had been in the wind, in the waves. When the Lord saves, he brings peace, and peace in your heart and life produces worship of the Savior. When you have peace, you want to worship God. It's just part of it, and this is exactly what happened to them. The men in the boat were happy to have the Lord in the boat with them. They were convinced about who he was. This was the result of their witness of his power and authority over nature, even when nature was, nature was angry and dangerous. The power of God created the peace of God, which resulted in the worship of God. 
Peter had a big part of it. Fear, faith, fear, faith, worship. Peter's a long way from a perfect guy, but he's still an example for us to follow. Heavenly Father, thank you for this man, for his courage. Thank you for his, in, his impetuousness. Well, if he wasn't impetuous so often, there was a lot of things we wouldn't be able to learn. Thank you for him. Thank you for his faith. Thank you for his courage. Thank you for telling us about his failures. It helps us to understand he's not Superman. He's just a regular guy who loves you. And we can relate to that. Help us as we study from this man's life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming out tonight. Drive safe on the way home.